Thames barrier rolls into action for the 200th time. That surge tide, if we allowed that to go into London, there's a risk of it going over the walls and embankments. Taking weather models to the edge of space. It's important that we know the density in the thermosphere because even though it's very low, that causes a drag on satellites and that can cause issues with the, the tracking of them. And floods, mini tornadoes. What's next for the UK's weather? It'll be a chilly start to Saturday, but the weekend at least starts off relatively quiet. It's Friday, the 22nd of October, and you're listening to Weather Snap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin, and this is Weather Snap, the insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Following a tragic storm in the 1950s, some complex climate calculations and some very complex engineering, the Thames Barrier opened in London in 1983. This week, the barrier was operated for the 200th time as heavy rain and high tides conspired to inundate the capital. To find out more about the barrier and this latest event, Claire Nazir spoke to Environment Agency Operations Manager Andy Batchelor. My job as operations manager is basically looking after the tidal flood risk management of London. Basically, that came about following the flood in 1953, where unfortunately 300 people lost their lives in the East Coast and 1,700 people in the Netherlands. And what we're looking at is basically London is built in a floodplain. Um, the Romans got it right. They built the city of London on high ground. But um, a lot of London, as we know it now, 400,000 properties, 1.4 million people are actually at risk of flooding. So after the 53 flood, there was various ways to manage that flood risk. Um, that was, do we just continue to raise the walls along the embankments or do we build a barrier? And what was decided was that we would keep London as it was, but we'd build a barrier at Woolwich. And by building the barrier there, we then had to raise all the walls and embankments to the coast by about three metres. And wherever um, a tributary came in, we then had to build another barrier. So there's ancillary barriers all the way out to the estuary so that basically we can contain any surge tides. So today is Thursday, the 21st of October, and it's the 200th time that the Thames barrier has been closed. Why are you closing it today? Today is very much a textbook example, really, of the weather for what the barrier was designed for. So predominantly what we see is low weather systems across the British Isles. And what people may not realise is that once that goes across volumes of water, it sort of artificially lifts the sea. And that's what we reference as a surge. So couple that with the normal tides that come down the east coast. Um, and we've got spring tides at the moment, which are the highest of the tides of a month coupled with northwesterly winds. So we've got high spring tides, a surge due to the weather and winds pushing it down the coast. When it gets down to the bottom, it's a bit of a small gap to then go around the Dover Strait. So coming up the Thames estuary is a better option. And so that surge tide is what we're forecasting. And if we allowed that to go into London, there's a risk of it going over the walls and embankments. Is that pretty much the criteria for most times through that last 199 times it has been closed? It certainly is for the tidal side, but the other aspect that we need to take account of is the rainfall flow. The Thames catchment spreads, you know, Reading, Oxford, wherever it rains in those areas, at some point has got to come past London to get out to the sea. So we would close if... Um, that combination because basically the walls in the centre of London have been left at the same as 53 so that everyone can enjoy London as we love our capital city but what that means is we're looking here in our Thames Barrier control room to see the rainfall flow that's trying to get out to the sea combined with the tide that's trying to come in and if the combination of A plus B means that that would have a river level going over in the centre of London we can't stop the rainfall, but what we can do is stop the tide. Is there a critical number or volume of water where the Thames Barrier, obviously up to now, has succeeded in protecting London, but in years to come may not? Back in the uh, 50s and 60s, when the barrier was being designed, climate change, global warming weren't in the dictionary then, but we had excellent records in the Thames and knew that the level was rising. And that, that was seen as a combination of a bit of 
ice age recovery with the southeast sinking um, and also sea level rise. So as engineers, we allowed for that. We drew the line on the graph and said, you know, barrier structures like ours will last for about 60 or years. So we took that through to 2030, taking that rate of rise and then said that we would apply a one in a thousand year level of protection because it was our capital city. That is the level that the barrier is designed for. So on current predictions, we expect the Thames barrier to still be functioning by 2070. It's at that point that we might need a new barrier or to actually modify the existing. What we will do in the interim is though that um, we may have to raise some of the local defences to actually keep that whole system intact. Well, the use of tidal barriers seems to fit the weather theme this week with conditions that switched from almost 20 degree heat on Monday to heavy rain and mini tornadoes across the country on Wednesday. That same day, Ferring in West Sussex reported broken walls, fences and smashed up garden furniture. Violent conditions extended as far as Cornwall and the area of low pressure responsible was named by the French Met Service as Storm Aurore. While the French coastline and the Channel Islands experienced gusts of up to 70 miles an hour, many rivers across southern England burst their banks, having received about two weeks worth of rain in just six hours. Storm Aurore finally cleared the UK yesterday morning, but what can we expect over the next few days? Aidan has the details. It looks like there'll be some more lively showers around later this weekend and the start of next week. But the weekend at least starts off relatively quiet. It'll be a chilly start to Saturday in places, particularly in the east of the UK where temperatures will dip close to freezing and there'll be a touch of frost around first thing. A few mist and fog patches possible as well, particularly in the southeast of England. But once these clear, plenty of dry and bright weather for many on Saturday. The best of any sunny spells will be in the east. Further west, the cloud will thicken and there'll be a few light showers around. The breeze will also pick up, but this time it's coming from the southwest rather than the northwest. So it'll be a touch milder, I think, for many on Saturday afternoon with highs of 13 to 15 Celsius. However, later in the day, it looks like rain will set in across Northern Ireland and Western Scotland. And overnight, that wet weather turns more persistent and increasingly heavy, particularly for Western Scotland and Southwest Scotland, where some large rainfall totals will build up through the night. By the start of Sunday, a mild start for many because of the breeze overnight and increased cloud cover, but a wet start for much of northern and western UK with that band of rain pushing into western England as well as Wales. However, through the morning, the rain will turn more showery and really Sunday looks like a showery day for many, particularly in the north and the west with some lively downpours for Scotland and Northern Ireland but it will stay largely dry and bright to the southeast with some sunny spells and it'll be a touch milder compared to Saturday. The showery theme continues into the start of next week with some thunder and hail possible in places, but in between the showers there will be some sunny spells. With the weather coming in from the southwest or west, it looks like the wettest parts of the UK will be in the northwest with the driest and brightest weather towards the southeast. Aidan McGiven, thank you. The Earth's atmosphere consists of a number of layers, each having different properties, and while the weather we experience here at the surface is formed in a layer known as the troposphere, there is interaction between conditions down here and much further out to space. To understand what's going on in the troposphere, many weather forecasters rely on a computer modelling system known as the Unified Model, or UM for short. Until now, the model has extended outwards to about 85 kilometres beyond the Earth's surface. Now, though, there are plans to extend that even further to give us a better understanding of conditions in near space. To explain, here's David Jackson of the Met Office Space Weather Centre. The unified model is, is um, a representation of the atmosphere through equations, and it's used for weather prediction and it's also used for climate change studies. We've recently developed, extended the model up to 150 kilometres. And the reason for this is to help with our um, activities in space weather. 
what we do at the Met Office for our operational forecast is we run a range of models which model the processes from the sun to the earth. It's known that um, the thermosphere and the ionosphere can be influenced by the lower atmosphere. There are a number of wave motions that are generated in the, the lower atmosphere that can or have an influence at higher levels. And so one is, is tides. So you get, get, get tides in the ocean, but you also get tides in the atmosphere. And uh, they can influence the, the lower thermosphere, but through other mechanisms, they can influence high levels of both the thermosphere and, and ionosphere higher up, at maybe 300 kilometers. It's where a uh, lot of the satellites fly. And so it's important that we know the, the density in the thermosphere, because even though it's, even though it's very low, uh, that causes a drag on the satellites and that can cause issues with uh, the tracking of them. This week, a new episode of our sister series, Mostly Climate, takes a look at the science informing decision makers at the forthcoming COP26 climate event. Hosts Doug McNeil and Rosie Oakes discuss the latest COP science report known as AR6. This heavyweight document draws on the work of literally thousands of scientists and gives an indication of our climates as it is now and what it may look like in the future. Here, guest speaker Dr. Helene Hewitt describes the number of individuals involved in producing just one chapter of the AR6 report. So in our chapter, there were uh, three coordinating lead authors, 15 lead authors, five chapter scientists and 74 contributing authors and uh, three review editors. And of those 80,000 comments for the whole report, our chapter alone dealt with 10,000 comments. Another contributor to this Mostly Climate episode is Dr Chris Jones. Here, he outlines the stark reality of AR6's findings. We know that we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuel. Natural ecosystems, so whether it's plants, vegetation, rainforests, they absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And over the last few decades, they've absorbed approximately half of all the emissions we've put. So the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has only increased by half as much as it could have done. The more we put into the atmosphere, probably the less of this natural service we're going to get back. So if you like, the harder we hit nature, the less help it's going to give us in return. The Met Office is Dr Chris Jones. And you can listen to that full Mostly Climate episode at our SoundCloud or YouTube weather channels. Just before we go, Aidan's back with last week's highs and lows. Here are your extremes from Monday the 11th to Sunday the 17th of October. The highest maximum temperature was on Sunday the 17th in Cardiff with a high of 19.5 Celsius. The temperature dipped to minus 3.6 Celsius in Reedsdale Camp on Saturday the 16th of October. That was the lowest minimum temperature. And the sunniest day was on Wednesday the 13th with 10 hours of sunshine recorded at Camborne. The wettest weather, meanwhile, was captured by Russellach in the highlands of Scotland on Monday the 11th of October with a rainfall total of 30.0 millimetres. Thanks again, Aidan. That's it for Weather Snap. I'm Alex Deakin, and the editor is Adrian Holloway. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.